So. I hope Great. that's okay that you're being recorded. Yeah, sure, that's fine. <laughs> let me let me just introduce you and we'll get started. So we're very happy to have uh, Lexi Constantino from UC Riverside. And she is going to be telling us about, as you see here, the narrow width approximation in ADS. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, I, everyone can see and hear okay? Yeah. I assume, cool. So yeah, so uh, I, I'm at UCR, I'm a fourth year grad student. And so, you know, I'm starting to think about, you know, applying for, for postdocs and all that. Um, so it's, it's, thank you all for being here and for having me today. So uh, like, like Marcus mentioned, um, today I will be telling you about the breakdown of the narrow width approximation and other aspects of time-like processes in ADS. So um, I know some, so this work is um, based on a few papers that Sylvain and I have together and uh, as well as with my advisor, Flip. Um, Flip is at uh, UC Riverside and, and Sylvain is in Brazil. Um, and it's, a lot of it is still a work in progress, but I'm really excited to be able to share it with you. Um, so uh, it, just in case you're not familiar, um, I'm going to go over some some basics in ADS and you know tell you a little bit about why you might care uh, uh, about stuff that goes on in ADS. So about 20 years ago, um, uh, Maldasena and a few others um, published some papers showing that uh, models in ADS uh, in in four plus one dimensions are dual to um, strongly coupled. Uh, conformal field theories, which are essentially scale invariant theories um, in, in, in three plus one dimensions. And so, and in these CFTs, there's a lot of um, unique and novel phenomena that um, that often uh, is described by these theories, including like non-integer uh, operators with non-integer dimensions, and this gives rise to like non-integer forces and, and other things that don't typically look like the particles that we usually see in QFT. Um, and in addition, there's there's things like uh, soft bombs, which are these uh, quasi-spherical like cascade decays. So in the standard model, we're used to, you know, maybe thinking about like jets, things that come out like back to back, but um, in ADS, things can look a bit different. And so if you're interested in, you know, you unique things, much unlike, you know, the stuff we see, this could be interesting. Um, so I'm going to, like I mentioned, I'm going to go over some of the basics. So uh, ADS is a uh, maximally symmetric space with constant negative uh, curvature everywhere, scalar curvature everywhere. And um, so this is the metric I'll be using throughout today's talk in the, in, on the right hand side. Um, Technical note where the uh, Poincaré patch, but that's just for the experts. Um, but to, to get to this metric, you see that we have essentially what looks like a, a just a flat space metric with the plus minus 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 signature. Um, to get to four plus one dimensional ADS, I'm going to tack on an extra direction, which I'll call Z. And then the entire thing is warped up and down by this one over kz prefactor. So uh, I may refer to this as the warp, uh, as like a warping factor, a warp factor. Um, and it essentially just warps up and down your length scales uh, at, in, at various positions in, in ADS. And so I've shown this here, how you know various factors get warped up and down at large and small z. So here z goes from zero to infinity. Um, but uh, some people, including myself in this talk, will be talking often about uh, a slice of ADS where there's some smallest Z that is larger than zero and some, some largest Z that is you know, not infinite. And so these are uh, ZUV and ZIR. And um, the, the endpoints here are, are brains. And some fields can be localized on these brains. 
So I won't be talking too much about the standard model, but for the purpose of today's talk, you could imagine that the standard model is localized on the UV brain. And then there could be some other fields in the bulk. The brains um, set some, uh, sorry, the, the brains set boundary conditions for this bulk field. There's some, you know, semi-generic semi boundary condition here in the UV and in the IR. And notice the IR position is set by this mu scale. This will pop up in a second, but um, very much like when you have uh, a particle in a box in undergrad quantum mechanics, when you have two brains, when you have these two boundary conditions, you'll have a, whoops, a set of uh, discrete modes that in flat space would correspond to something like the momentum of the particle um, in, in this direction. Um, and so just to review, uh, you know, I, the particle in a box, you have, you know, a, in, in flat space, you have, you know, a field that is conf confined between two hard walls. And when you do this, um, there's this discrete tower of modes and each one is, is something like a different mo discrete momentum, but each, each mode has a certain profile in the box. And these profiles are related to kind of the probability of, of finding the, the particle at various places in the box. And the energy of these modes increases with, with you know, the, the mode number. And uh, we have something very similar in ADS. And instead we call these uh, KK modes. And there's, there's a tower of them, like I mentioned. They have, uh, they each have a profile, which very roughly corresponds to the probability of finding them at various places in the bulk. And the mass of these modes, um, the mass of these modes increases with, with, with um, this N. So it starts at zero or one. Um, and so, you know, just, just to review a bit more, um, when, when you have propagation in, in the bulk, um, when you have propagation in the bulk, you can write it as, you know, this complicated function with tons of Bessel functions. Um, and, and the reason why there's so many is because of these boundary conditions you have to satisfy. Um, but a, a really ni nice representation for this propagator is to, is, is the structural representation, which I've written here, where, um, uh, where the, all the poles, uh, sorry, the, it, it makes the analytic structure of the propagator um, like a parent just by looking at it. So these Fs are the KK profiles that I mentioned earlier. And you can see right here, so, so, so these are analytic functions, and then you can see where all the poles are immediately by looking at the denominator. So you have one at pi mu, two pi mu, and so on. So, pardon me, if you go ahead and plot, uh, you know, just where these poles are, if you put little dots, you'll see that there is, you know, just this tower of poles that are roughly spaced by pi mu, like I mentioned. And in the free theory, these are, are roughly right on the axis, right, right where P is real. And we typically talk about the Feynman prescription. So when we do this, we're just shifting all the poles off the axis by an infinitesimal amount. And once, once we do this, we shift all the poles by an infinitesimal amount. Um, uh, a, a quantity that pops up in a lot of uh, S-channel time-like processes, like you collide, you know, particle and antiparticle, and, and for instance, um, uh, is this propagator modulus squared? And if you plot this for, for real time-like momentum, um, so you, uh, the, you're plotting it here, it has some finite value, it gets near the pole, flows up near infinity, comes back down to some finite value, gets near another pole and so on. And so you have these, you, you just have a bunch of narrow resonances. And so this, this is all for, for, the, for the free theory when there's just no interactions. So the interesting stuff happens when we now consider interactions. So this is a tiny bit more review, but now this is um, 
you know, just, uh, I'm gonna guide you through like a, just like we're gonna naively pay, put this together and see what happens. So if we have some sort of interaction, let's just say a, a three point interaction between the, the different KK modes, um, then the two point function um, will not just be the propagator, but a bunch of, of quantum corrections. And so the way that um, you may have learned to do this is to, um, uh, th these corrections are given by various 1PI insertions. So this, this 1PI is a sum of these one particle irreducible diagrams. I've shown a few here. Um, and this, uh, this pi in this context is called the, the self energy. And so I've written this suggestively as a series. And so typically in 4D, what you do is you just um, write out all the terms. You have, you have G, which is here, then G pi G, which is here and so on. You sum it up and you get something that looks like this. So naively, just for this, uh, you know, in introduction, you could you could think, well, in the spectral representation with the KK modes, maybe the propagator should look like this. Okay. So the real part of pi shifts the poles left to right. This, this is your mass and wave function renormalization. But then the imaginary part of pi shifts the poles up, uh, I mean, it, it shifts down um, from, yeah, no, never mind. It's just some down um, off the act below the axis. And these, um, sorry, yeah, it shifts them down below the axis. And you could imagine that if this black line here is a light KK mode, like a, the fifth one, and this red one, it, this red one is it can only be the first or second, you know, KK modes running in this loop. But if you have the thousandth KK mode here, you could imagine that there could be hundreds of KK modes in this loop. And so just naively, just for the sake of argument, maybe this pi could increase, the imaginary part could increase as you go on um, for, for the heavier KK modes, leading to them being further off the axis. And so, um, sorry, um, and so, if, if we go through this process again, where we, you know, uh, are plotting out the, the value of the propagator squared, uh, mod, mod squared, you get close to a pole, but not infinitely uh, close. And so this peaks up. The next one, you get close, but not as close. Uh, and so it peaks, but not as high, and so on. You could imagine that uh, this process could go on, and eventually this distance here could become very large. In which case, sorry, in which case you're never really actually getting closer to one pole than another. And you might end up with something like this, where instead of having a function that goes up and down, you have something that, you know, is just some constant value everywhere. So if this were the case, so everything so far is just hypothetical, I'm just reasoning something out with you guys. Um, if this were the case, then some, uh, so the, the, the width here is, is the typical width that you see when you uh, consider, uh, when you think of like resonant production at, at colliders, for instance, this is, this is your narrow resonance. And uh, so these first few KK modes are sufficiently narrow so that it, it, it makes sense to talk about resonant production of, of like a KK mode here. Like, when you're here, you're you're kind of producing the, the you're producing the lightest KK mode. Um, but what happens down here um, is does it make sense to say that we produce the eleventh KK mode or the twentieth or the hundredth when we're when when the function is nearly continuous? Um, and to add a another layer of complexity. Um, we assume this, that all these resonances, that, all, that this pi was, was diagonal. So it, you know, that you'd have the first KK mode here, first one here, and then you'd have mass one, pi one. But in principle, that, like, it, it doesn't have to be that way. You can even have 
alt diagonal components that mix the KK mode. So this would be something like a mass mixing. So certainly when pi becomes large and these effects become important down here, um, you know, at large KK number, um, certainly it, it, it makes a little bit less sense to say that we're, you know, we're producing a hundredth KK mode or something. Um, so I have a few questions to, to now to guide the rest of the talk and to get into um, specifically my, my, my research. And that is, is this continuum regime at large KK number, is this something that's like real? Is it physically realizable or is it just, you know, did I somehow lead you, you know, something we did when we were just naively reasoning through things was maybe wrong. Um, and then secondly, um, this uh, actually, sorry, spoiler for the first question, the answer is yes, it is physically realizable, but the rest of the talk will just be on the journey of how we, we get there. Um, the second question is, is if we were to naively treat these heavy KK modes as you know, being narrow and good asymptotic states, we talk about production of these heavy ones, um, could we be missing something? And, you know, could something we, we would be doing be wrong if, if we were to, to do that? Um, so all of this uh, hopefully motivates uh, wanting to do a, a quantitative study on, on what exactly happens with the widths of these KK modes. And so the goal is to get to something like this. So uh, based on what I've just told you, the outline would be as follows. So we solve the equation of motion subject to the brain boundary conditions. This gives us the propagator. Fine, check, that's already done in the literature. Um, okay, then we calculate the self-energy and resum the propagator. Okay, that would involve doing something like this that, that you know, I, I briefly showed earlier. From there, we would, you know, want to analyze the KK mode widths, like properly, not just in this naive way, hand wavy way I, I, I mentioned. And this would give us, you know, something like this, hopefully. So this is what we would like to do, but the middle step is actually really hard. And it's, it's hard because the propagator looks like this. There's a product of, of over here, one, two, three, four vessel functions divided by four others. Um, and it's just an absolute mess when you have, when you do calculate the self energy, you have multiple of these propagators all integrated over. Um, and you either have to resort to tons of approximations, which are not transparent at all, or you just have to give it to a computer and have, a computer do it, um, which, you know, is fine, but it's also sometimes not satisfying. Um, so I will propose um, an alternative path. Instead, we solve the equation of motion without brain. This gives us the propagator that is not subject to the brain boundary conditions, but it can instead go to zero and infinity. Um, from there, we calculate the self-energy and resum this propagator. This is a lot easier because there's only two Bessel functions as opposed to endless products of them. And then I would like to tell you about this neat way that Sylvain, my collaborator, and I have found to then take the brains into account after the fact. Um, and this is you know, unpublished work. This is just new and exciting stuff that I'm really happy to tell you about. Um, and then this will allow us to analyze the KK mode widths and determine if the continuum that we saw earlier is actually a real thing. Okay, so step one is to get the propagator. And that is, that's as far as we can go in the free theory. That, that, that is, that's it right there. Uh, now we have to introduce interactions. So, to be semi-general, we, we want to consider a scalar field in ADS that has various cubic interactions. So we have um, a, a standard cubic interaction and 
a higher derivative cubic interaction. Um, we won't be considering four point vertices or, or higher, um, but we, we, we wanna see what happens with these higher dimension operators as well, so, some of them. Um, so this gamma in front is, ha have no fear, that is just the metric factors that I mentioned earlier. In particular, this is the square root of the determinant of the metric, but just don't mind it at all. Um, as I mentioned, both of these vertices are, are cubic. And so there's the lambda, which is the renormalizable one, and the zeta, which is the uh, higher dimension operator. So um, by what is called naive dimensional analysis, we can assign uh, values to these couplings uh, in terms of loop factors and in terms of the higher dimension, uh, sorry, the high, the high mass scale and the EFT. So uh, as is typical in, in EFT, you have that the higher dimension operator is, uh, you know, suppressed by this, this higher mass scale. Here it's suppressed by, by it to the uh, three halves power. And okay, so we have our interactions. And so what you think is then we do this process that I mentioned. Could you go back for a second? Yeah, sure. Shouldn't it be suppressed by two powers of lambda? Uh, for the zeta? Oh, it is suppressed by two powers. Never mind. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, so what you would think now, as, as I led you to believe and advertised, is that we, we now are going to just write down these 1PI, all these diagrams that contribute to this, to the self-energy, and we're just going to sum them up. Um, but it turns out that this is also pretty difficult because the propagator and the self-energy both depend on Z and Z prime. And so there's a lot of position integrals to be done for all these terms. And, um, but fear not, there is an easier way, um, certainly. Can I, can I, yeah. can, I ask, can I ask a question? I should have asked that before. Can you go back to the, the slide that John was asking about? Yeah, here. Yeah. I mean, uh, as you can see from the, the dimensions, right? The cubic coupling here is, is, is it's a relevant coupling. And so, that means that it gets strong at low energies, okay? And so if I wanted this to be under control, I would roughly have to take my momenta to be large compared to lambda. Otherwise, I don't have perturbative control. You know, two loops would be bigger than three loops and so on. So for the first term, I would need momentum large compared to lambda. The second term, it's the opposite. It has a one, it has a lambdas in the denominator. So that term is actually only weak if the momentum is small compared to lambda. So if you really mean, I don't know if you, uh, if you have both of these terms at the same time, then there's no regime where perturbation theory works. So are you considering them both at the same time or are you just gonna consider them one at a time or, or, or what? So um, the I will so, so we consider them both, and there is a way to see your concern uh, in some sense emerge in the um, in actually maybe a dozen slides if you can wait. All right, um, but but um, yeah, I think I think there's a slide that you, that that may resolve this. Um, but let let me know beforehand if 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 yeah, if anything else comes up. Um, okay, so I can, I can bring it up again if it's. Uh, but anyway, I'm just saying that there's a these are these these are these these terms. We really don't even know what they well. We, we can't really make sense out of them in perturbation theory, I claim, at the same time. There's no regime where we know how to treat both of those couplings perturbatively in the same theory. In, in some sense, um, 
Yeah, so so there will be a, a point where um where a what appears to be a a I believe uh, th there's a logarithmic divergence that will pop up at, at, at um in in the weak coupling regime that you will I I, I sorry in, in the um I believe it's the low low PZ res regime that that will pop up. I, I I think in a few sides, at the very least, if it, if it doesn't resolve your question, I think it'll add more to the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, so instead of uh, doing that uh, that process that I mentioned earlier, right here, mm -hmm. there is a better way, and this is a way that's you know, in the textbooks, but it, um, it isn't, certainly isn't the first way that I learned. Um, and that is the schwinner dyson equation for the, the two-point function. And so this, the claim is that this, uh, by solving this equation, um, you end up getting the, the dress propagator just as you would by doing this, um, by, you know, summing up all the terms like I mentioned. Um, so this this D out in front is the the wave operator that appears in the equation of motion. So in in flat space, uh, in four D flat space, this would be your your D squared plus M squared that you would see in like the Klein Gordon equation. So if you ignore the middle term, you have D squared plus M squared acting on the propagator is um, minus I times delta. Um, so this this extra term is is what gives us the uh, you know the the resummation it, it gives us the dressing, and the way to see this is the following: if you break, um, I'm, so I'm going to breeze through this um, because it is out there um, in the literature, but um, I mean in in like textbooks. But if you break the dressed propagator, the resummed propagator, up into g zero, g one, and so on terms. And you reorganize, it, it, you regroup uh, all the terms in this equation as follows, where g0 is, is just given, dg0 is given by the delta function, and g1 is sourced by g0. Um, we see that this g0 will just be the, the bare propagator um, that you would get from, like, for instance, the Klein Gordon equation. And, uh, you know, this is a, g1 and so on would be a correction. If you then Fourier transform and substitute them into each other, you can find that G1 is actually, oops, where's my eyes? G1 is actually G0 pi G0. If you repeat, you can find that G2 is G0 pi G0 pi G0. And this just generates all the different terms in the series. Um, but it turns out in ADS, this is actually the easier way to go. Uh, uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, if you drew out the diagrams in Schwinger Dyson, the the internal lines in the diagram use the full propagator. Is that what's going on in your integral? I don't see how that's. What's the Feynman diagram that corresponds to that integral? So. Um, Oh, uh, so um, uh, to what, this what is pi? Here. Is pi vacuum polarization or is um, it else? Yeah, so so pi here should should just be the self energy. Here here it'd be in momentum space, but here it's in position. In in momentum space, this is just the Dyson series, where you. Right, the prop insert the self energy any number of times. Yeah, but that's but in different. Position space, it be the the product in momentum space becomes a convolution. Yes, that's, that's not the Schwinger Dyson equation, right? Uh, the difference between Schwinger yeah, Dyson. I think I would and call Dyson. it the Dyson equation, but yeah, Dyson. Right. Is, that's the Dyson. Schwinger Dyson equation. is a non perturbative uncontrolled approximation. Okay. Um, 
I think, like yeah, I think the it. Is, it's just called, the, it's usually this is called the Dyson equation. The Schwinger okay. Dyson equation is something a little different. It relates, <laughs> it relates different things. It looks similar, but it's, it relates different things. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry if I, if I, uh, if, if I confuse the two. Um, so essentially, so uh, we, we end up with, uh, we we have we have this here in so so okay so I've written now I've written down the the version in ADS five so the, the the main difference here is that um, first there's this, this this gamma that's in front these are just more metric factor more you know factors of the metric um, then uh, I have also Fourier transformed partially so that instead of having five position intervals. Um, I have one remaining, and then correspondingly, there's only one delta function instead of a five. Um, so our, our job is to um, is to uh, is to solve this this differential equation, and so at sufficiently large p z, um, it turns out that we can use the ansatz of of the, sorry, the, the bare propagator at, at large PZ goes as an oscillating exponential with, with additional prefactors, of course. Um, and so our ansatz is to, uh, to shift this by some function uh, S. And so um, this was in our most recent paper, uh, uh, and, and we refer to this as the WKB, WKB function because it turns out that this uh, ansatz is very similar to the WKB approximation. Um, and so by substituting this in, uh, if we can determine S, then we know what the resum to propagator is. And so- Why doesn't S depend on P? Uh, it, it does depend on P. I, I, I'm sorry if that's, um, the, yeah, I'm, I, I'm sorry for not including that. It, it absolutely does. And it, um, and so uh, uh, going forward and uh, addressing the propagator with the um, specifically, we, we focus on the imaginary part of the of the self energy, and um, so okay, so so the dress propagator goes as this e to the minus s, and so it. Like I mentioned, if we know S, then, then we know the resum propagator. And so we're going to have different contributions to the self energy from the, depending on which diagram we draw. Um, so I mentioned we have these lambda and these zeta vertices. The zeta are, the, the lambda are the relevant, the zeta are the higher dimension operators that are irrelevant at low energies. And so we can, we can match these in, in different ways. We can do, um, a lambda lambda, or we could draw a bubble with a lambda and a zeta, or two zetas. And so depending on the, the contribution to the self energy that we choose, we get different uh, forms for this S function. Um, it turns out that um, for the S function with, with using just two lambdas, lambda vertices, we get something that is logarithmic. So it turns out that there's the E and the logarithm cancel. Um, but for both of the uh, bubbles that use the zeta vertex, we actually get something that goes as a polynomial in PZ. So for the lambda zeta, we get, the, we get something that goes as PZ squared. And for the zeta zeta, we get something that's PZ to the fourth. So um, of Marcus, the thing I was hinting at earlier is this is this logarithm. So I guess as you go to arbitrarily small energies, you 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 have if you have very small p, you you have something that I guess blows up in uh, that direction. Um, well, lambda was your phi cubed coupling, and zeta yes. was your higher derivative coupling. Yes, exactly. Um, and so now if we consider, um, so, so uh, you know, to get to this form of the dress propagator, we assumed large PZ. And I say large in quotes, because it's 
you know, it's, it's order one, but it, it depends on what, um, you know, some of the different thing, parameters are. Um, and so it seems, so this is 10 to the minus five. If, if we're at large phi z, we have 10 to the minus five times a logarithm, 10 to the minus five times p z squared, and 10 to the minus seven times p z to the fourth. So as we go, so uh, th this middle term will be dominant over the logarithm, but if we go to too high of p z, the zeta zeta will become dominant. And when we get to that point, we'll know that something's going on with the EFT. Something's going on, it's breaking down in some way. Um, so for most of the region we're, we're considering, this is gonna be the dominant contribution to S. So, so, sorry, can I, can, we ask, sorry, can I ask some questions here? This is- um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, so, uh, Let's see. Uh, one thing that one thing that's I find confusing is that um, you know if I'm if I'm computing uh, pi in uh, if I'm computing pi in momentum space, then the imaginary part is the piece that is directly related to the width, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, if, 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 uh, but somehow in this ansatz, you're writing this, this thing as e to the i times s. It's looking like your ansatz is somehow, uh, well, I guess, I guess I don't, uh, so I guess the real and imaginary, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it looks like the, your real and imaginary part in your ansatz are always the same because essentially the same because your 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 function is like this e to the i s function right huh. so it's like sines and cosines but it seems but, like uh, uh sorry for the confusion it's actually e to the i p z which is the bear propagator it comes from uh the henkel function and then there's the oh, minus I, damping okay okay so s all right so s i would have to have an imaginary part for that to be Yes, uh, exactly. But this is the full dress propagator. It's not pi. Oh, so it, you've, you've already, you didn't go through, you, you're giving us the answer. You haven't told us what pi is. You've already, that's already in here. Yeah, so we calculate the leading contribution to pi, which, um, would be given by um, you know the, the, this bubble with the various vertices that we that whoops sorry. So did you make some approximation like do you these internal propagators strictly speaking are in ADS, but did you somehow yeah. approximate them with flat space propagators or something to do this calculation? Nope. Uh, the the approximation that we did was to use the the propagators when there's no brains. So they're still, they're still vessel functions, but they are not, um, and they're not as complicated as the crazy one I showed earlier, but, but we definitely are using ADS propagators. So, so to, um, this E to the I P Z comes from a Henkel function and it comes with additional prefactors in front. So there's like a Z to the three halves plus. Yeah. So this is the brain. This is the brain to bulk propagator. So z is the coordinate in the bulk. Yeah. So, so um, this actually should be the the bulk to bulk propagator because in this calculation we um, I'm, I'm temporarily ignoring brains um, and just doing this calculation without brains. And so there's there's two z's. And uh, the one that appears in in the the s function is the the greater of the two z's. And that that's because the uh, the the bare propagator itself is split into z greater and z less than. Um, okay, and and just remind me your convention mm -hmm. again. Z big is ir or uv. Z big is the the one that's uh, the the one that's further into the ir. Okay, All right, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so no no problem. Um, 
So, so yeah, so um, at this point, um, we have a dressed propagator, depends on Z and Z prime. Um, it is an oscillating exponential, which is, you know, which is known for large PZ. Um, this, is, this is just the expansion, you know, the asymptotic behavior of the Henkel function. Um, but then we now have this exponential decaying piece. And um, this C is a 10 to the minus five with some extra couplings. And so this looks like the propagator is exponentially suppressed from, from propagating into the very, very large Z region. Um, yeah, but here, here's where, I mean, this is where my, I think my comment from before, you know, is relevant because uh, these, what I claim is that just because of their dimensionality and because you are making a, you are making a weak coupling approximation, right? You're, you're only calculating the one loop diagram. You're not calculating three, four, whatever, higher loop diagrams. And so your that approximation is only valid if all the couplings, the terms you're neglected are smaller. But absolutely, uh, the, the problem is that lambda and zeta are small in mutually exclusive kinematic regions. So there's never, I don't think there's ever any kinematic region where both lambda and zeta, where this term that you're keeping here, this lambda zeta term is, uh, is under control. So in case this helps at all, so the, um, the uh, next question I was going to ask is, we have this thing that looks like an exponential suppression, but we also have an EFT that can break down. Um, and, and where is this limit of validity? Um, I um, won't comment on like the, the, the lambda lambda beyond, you know, we have this logarithm and, and it, it appears when we have very, very small PZ, it, it may give us an issue. Um, but um, it appears that for, for somewhat large PZ, it's, 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 it seems to be fine. Um, and so we know that the, some, something will happen with the zeta zeta interaction and um, the EFT will break down it, it at large PZ because we saw that it's PZ to the fourth. Um, and so, you know, before we actually say if this exponential suppression is like a real thing, we have to make sure that we're in the, in the limit of the validity of the EFT. So okay. the way to yeah, do- Maybe I focus too much on your, you, you gave expressions for lambda and zeta in terms of this one scale capital lambda. Maybe you don't really mean that if you, as long as you're not using that relationship, there is some regime where if both lambda and zeta are sufficiently small in some sense, then then you're okay. Yes. Yeah, so the lambda is. You can you talk about what that regime is? I mean, before you gave the yeah. reason was confusing. Before you gave some expressions for lambda and zeta, and if you if you use those expressions, then there's no regime where they're both valid. But if you're allowing more general values, then it's okay. So I I believe the the way we're introducing the the way that we're introducing a lambda, I think um, um, is I, I believe it's just a way to to parameterize when like when the EFT breaks down for, for, for the zeta coupling, like I, like I don't think you have to prioritize right. lambda and like little lambda. You're not, you're not necessarily using, right, but you don't necessarily use the same, as long as you don't use the same lambda for both, uh, for the same capital lambda for both little lambda and zeta. Because the problem is, and the, it's a, it's the bounds are on different sides of capital lambda, okay? Little yeah. lambda is breaking down or perturbation theory is breaking down for P less than capital lambda, but for zeta, it's breaking down for P bigger than capital lambda. So you don't want to use the same capital lambda for both little lambda and zeta. Yeah. As long as you're not doing that, it's fine. 
Okay. Why don't um, you go on? Let's see what. Sort okay. Of so the um, so the 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 way to parameterize when the when the when the uh, EFT breaks down for for large large energies, large PZ, is to compare these these two um, values of S. So so um, uh, it, you know if we if we compare these two and the contribution from zeta zeta is is just as large, um, then we know that something is going on with the EFT. And so the way to compare them, we right now we have lambda and zeta, and here we have zeta zeta. So we need to put them on on some sort of more equal footing, like we need to relate them some way. So if we introduce the um, the NDA values of the parameters here, uh, we we can we can relate them. Just um, so, you know, they both have so they both end up just having this this capital lambda in them. Um, and so the lambda zeta ends up being this here, and the zeta zeta ends up being this here. The exponential suppression starts when this top one is order one. Uh, so yeah, when the when this top when this s is order one. Prior to that, it's not really a suppression at all because um, we have e to the minus s. And so this happens when p z is roughly ten. Um, times the square root of lambda over k. Um, we can then determine when the EFT breaks down by comparing the size of the two. And this happens at a function of lambda over k without, without the square root. So they have a, a, a slightly different functional dependence. And so if we plot um, the functional dependence of both of them, we see this. We see that the the PZ uh, at which the EFT breaks down is always at some larger value than the PZ at which this exponential suppression, which we call opacity, um, occurs. And so the the smallest value that that we can have by um, of this capital lambda is, is pi times k, and the two actually meet and slightly start to cross over a little bit at around pi k, but it happens at about the, 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 the uh, same scale. So it's interesting that at the um, smallest value of this, we, we can have these, these two merge. But uh, at all other values, um, we, we find that, that, where is it? That um, the region of, of exponential suppression happens before the region of EFT breakdown. So if you have a, a particle that's propagating, um, it, it will be suppressed from propagating into the region of EFT breakdown. Um, and so this was, uh, there was a, a different explanation for, for, for why particle propagation shouldn't happen into the EFT breakdown region given by um, Nima and, 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 uh, and, and Lisa Randall in their paper from 2000. Um, it uses, it, it, it does something different, but but the con, you know the uh, conclusion is is the same in in that sense. Um, so if we could imagine before we so the original goal was to have an IR brain as well and to calculate the widths of these KK modes. So um, so I'm just going to skip that detail for time, but. Um, so our next step is to somehow take the brains into account after the fact, because at this point, we calculated the self-energy and the propagator and then resum the propagator all without brains. And so there's actually a neat way to do this. And this is ongoing work with Sylvain, as I mentioned. Um, so typically, when you don't have interactions, it, or I, mean, I guess you could do it when you do have interactions as well, as we'll see. But when you vary the action, you typically get, um, you will get. Can I, can, oh. Sorry, can we go, go back to the, the last slide though, just for a second? Yeah. Uh, no, one more back or maybe a few more back, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah, that one right there, thanks. Mm -hmm. So on the, the figure on the right, right? So the point of this is to show that there's a region 
uh, so you're you're saying that to the to the left of the black, the EFT is under control, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, the red uh, to the right of the red is where you're getting this uh, opacity. So there's a region where the opacity effect is important, but yet the, it's under control, right? Mm -hmm. But I I I I, I'm, I, I think I don't agree with your estimate for where the EFT is breaking down. And the basic reason is because you're, uh, you know, you have one coupling lambda and the other coupling zeta, right? Zeta is the coupling that's getting big in the UV, okay? And so, and lambda is a coupling that's doing the opposite. It's getting weak in the UV. And you got the black line by comparing lambda times zeta effects to zeta squared effects, okay? But that, that I think you're gonna get a stronger bound on the EFT by comparing things you didn't look at apparently, which would be things like zeta to the fourth effects compared to zeta squared effects. So if you just left lambda out of it because zeta is the one that's causing you, uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I think I'm, I'm sorry. I think I actually might be, the, I'm sorry, but I think I, I may have turned things around uh, and confused things because I think uh, the problem is, uh, yeah, sorry, it's breaking down in the IR. So I, I had it backwards. I think your, your black line is coming from lambda lambda effects. Is that correct? The, sorry, the, um, the black line is coming from the, from the zeta zeta. So it, the black, the, the black okay. line comes from comparing zeta zeta to lambda zeta. Okay, then I'm very confused because let's see, just so the IR, the IR is towards the black. I, I, I don't know which way I'm pointing on your screen. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know the, the, the IR is the, towards the black. To yes. the right of the to the right of the black thing is the IR. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And so, and you're saying things are under control to the left. So things are under yes. control for sufficiently close to the UV. Yes. And yet that line is controlled by the zeta. So the, the zeta. Uh, so the the zeta. Whoops. I mean, it comes from it comes from comparing the lambda zeta to the, to the zeta zeta. Zeta zeta, right? Mm -hmm. Is anybody else confused? I thought I would have thought that if if the theory was good in the UV, uh, then its breakdown would have been controlled by the lambda lambda. Lambda is the coupling that gets the strongest in the IR. Am I? So uh, zeta is the coupling that gets the strongest in the IR. I... Zeta is, no, zeta I think the is the- Confusion is that they scale with p times z, so large z is infrared and small p is infrared. But here it's the product of the two. I uh, yes. So I mean, just let me just say that my my confusion maybe even doesn't is kind of even independent of this because it's just the point is that if I have a relevant coupling and an irrelevant coupling. And I'm trying to find out when do things break down. If I compare, you know, a lambda, a lambda, let's say a zeta zeta effect to a lambda zeta effect, that is a suboptimal bound. I should be comparing either lambda lambda to lambda to the fourth, or you know, sorry, yeah, or zeta zeta to zeta to the fourth. Those will give me the strongest bounds, I claim, not the cross terms. I have to look at because if one if some coupling is the strongest coupling that I have, so I'm confused about what's strong where. But if I just have a coupling and it is stronger than another coupling in some regime, then I get the biggest bound. The most important bound I get is just by using that coupling over and over again because it is the strongest coupling, not by inserting some other coupling that is weak there. So I think you will <laughs> always get the best bounds from either just higher powers of zetas or just higher powers of lambdas. You'll never get the, the correct bound by looking at the mixed terms. So, so 
if if zeta is the small one though, then then we would consider we we would have to compare increasing powers of, of zeta, right? Well, you want no, you want to, to say if the theory is getting strong, you want to put in the strongest coupling and require that it is weak, right? You take whatever the strongest coupling, the strongest coupling is, and you require that it not be so big that perturbation theory breaks down. And so you should just keep using that coupling over and over again. If the fact that there's some other coupling that's weak is, is, is not relevant for the bound. Do you see what I'm saying? So whichever coupling, because I'm confused about UV and IR apparently, but whichever coupling you think is the strongest one, okay, that's the one you've got to require to be not too strong. And, and, and you should compare it to itself. In other words, like higher loops of that coupling, not to some other coupling, which may be very weak, because that won't give you the, 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 the most, you know, the, the strongest bound. Okay. Um, if, if you'd like, I can uh, wrap this up quickly, digest that, and then That's we can okay. yeah, well, stop you, but I, or even after. I just, okay, I just wondered if I, I just was wondering if there was something I, I was missing, but I I don't know. But why don't you go on? I don't want to derail your talk. I apologize. So. Okay. So um, so no no worries at all. I, I really appreciate the questions. That's why I'm what I'm here for. Um, so uh, we want to, so we have the recent propagator without brains. We want to uh, account for the brains after the fact somehow. Um, and so the, the way I suggest to do this is, is the following. So um, as I mentioned, this will appear in, well, hopefully in an upcoming paper in the next couple of months. But um, typically when you vary the action, uh, you, you will get the, the equation of motion and you will also get um, a, a boundary term that's treat, usually treated separately. Um, in, in flat space, um, infinitely large flat space, this boundary term is, you know, it's just, you require the derivative to go to, uh, sorry, uh, when you're in flat space, you usually just throw out the derivative at the boundary. Um, but in ADS, you actually get like a boundary term. So, this is typically treated separately in like a separate equation. And the, uh, solving the, the equation of motion subject to the boundary condition gives this you know, propagator with brains. Um, alternatively, you can, you can treat uh, this, um, this uh, boundary operator as, as a dressing it appears in a similar way to you know, how the self-energy appeared in the Dyson equation. And you can write the, the propagator with brains in terms of a, a propagator without, for instance, let's consider one brain instead of two. You can write the propagator with an IR brain in terms of a propagator without an IR brain plus one insertion of this operator plus two and so on. Um, as I mentioned, that this, this operator is a derivative term plus any any uh, what we call brain masses localized out on the boundary, um, and we actually use this this dressing procedure to to go from the propagator without brains. We we dressed it with one brain and then the other brain to get the propagator with brains. And it's neat because the only inform additional information you need to specify is um, which side of the brain you will end up being on. Um, you know, is it is it to your smaller Z or your larger Z? Um, and so, you know, you can go from this to the Randall Centrum two type model propagator or, or whatever you'd like, um, anywhere in the middle with one brain or the other. So uh, this is what this is what I've claimed. Just now, we can go from one without brains to one with two brains. Um, but you can also do the stressing procedure on the resummed propagator. So you will go from a resummed propagator without brains to a resummed propagator with two brains. There is a very important asterisk here, however, because after all, we 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 calculated the self-energy with with without brains, and, and that just won't be updated by this 
is dressing. So um, this will overestimate the, the width for the first few K, K modes, but it should, should be okay for the larger ones. Um, which, you know, we, we care about the continuum, uh, seeing if there's a continuum at high energies anyway. So, so this should be the regime in which this, this is okay and it works out. Um, and so if you do this, um, uh, you can, you get the resumed propagator with two brains, you can plot it, and this is what you find. Uh, this is what I found. Um, um, there is, uh, the first few peaks are, are very narrow and uh, gradually the, they, they become more and more broad and merge to form a continuum. Um, I, I haven't shown the, you know, the, the scales because, you know, of course this will depend on the various parameters, the, the curvature and so on. Um, choosing some benchmark parameters, um, I found that, um, uh, that for the parameters I used, this, this happened roughly at about 20 times the KK scale, but it, it can also happen much, much higher. So this can in principle happen just after the first five or six-ish KK modes. Um, and the widths actually merge. So uh, one thing, very briefly, I mentioned, so I mentioned that the propagator is exponentially suppressed. The resumed propagator is exponentially suppressed from propagating deep into the IR, the large Z region. If there's an IR brain there, the, the, the energy scale, at the mass scale at which the IR brain becomes opaque to propagation is the same mass scale that the widths merge to form a continuum. So the, 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 uh, the effects of the IR brain uh, uh, kind of disappear from the propagator in two different ways above this mass scale, both because propagation to the IR is exponentially suppressed. And then in this KK picture, um, the widths above this merge to form a continuum. And uh, a continuum is typically what you see when you, when you don't have brains um, in, in, in ADS. If you, uh, or if you only have one brain, uh, like a UV brain, for instance. Um, then if we try to match this onto here um, to, see what, you know, to see what the individual widths of the KK modes would be. And as I meant, hinted at before, this doesn't work. And there's actually non-diagonal terms to the width matrix that are required to, uh, to match on the so, so plotting this here, we have the exact resum propagator, but um, without any sums or anything. Whereas if we want to match it on to this KK uh, representation with sums, um, you need a non-diagonal width matrix. Um, there's a neat paper about this, about, about non-diagonal width matri matrices and how the uh, quantum interference effects can occur that, that can enhance or, or um, suppress amplitudes. Um, and so if, if we have a continuum regime where the widths have merged, everything is, 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 is mixing, all the KK modes are mixing, uh, 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 mass mixing, and, you know, uh, just the widths getting large, um, it's kind of, uh, when we talk about these resonances, it's, it's, it's very clear what we mean when we produce one, but you know, what, what, what does it even mean if you produce something over here? Is this even okay to talk about as an asymptotic state? And that's, you know, the kind of the things we're thinking about now. Um, it, it doesn't seem, you know, very reasonable uh, in, in the same way that you would, you would talk about, you know, producing a narrow uh, resonance. Um, so uh, I'll just throw up the summary. It basically just says everything I just said, but um, thanks for having me here. I'm happy to chat more about any of those. Or, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks. Let's thank Lexi. Any questions by someone other than me? <laughs> Sorry to sl I slowed you down a lot. So no worries. Yeah, That's we have time, we have time for some for some discussion. Any any other anybody questions or comments? Yeah, I'm also confused about your coupling. Uh, 
Why do you need both lambda and the Casey couplings in your calculation? If you just have one of them, can you also do something that you do here? Um, so we, um, so for the, the, the lambda lambda appears to have the, like a logarithm like I showed. So, so you know, when, when you just have the lambda, it seems like, or if you just consider the effects of the lambda, it doesn't seem like you get this opacity effect. Um, for instance, um, it's only when you have, you know, like a, a higher higher derivative operator than you know the the non-renormalizable ones. The so if you it, just had zeta, would you say so if you just had zeta, what would happen if you just had zeta? If if you just had zeta, there there should be. It, it, I, I I believe there should still be some opacity effect. Um, you you would probably get it by comparing. Actually, let me think about that. You just have zeta. My intuition is that you should still have opacity, but you would also have the EFT breakdown and region as well. Um, I would have to think a little bit, but I, I, I believe you should, that is my intuition. Maybe another question is, did you guys think about the brain to brain propagator? Like if you, especially the UV brain to UV brain propagator, did you guys investigate that? Yes, yeah, so, um, so, so I did, we did not consider the, like um, any, any, uh, dressing, for instance, that may come from like a UV localized things, but those would probably be the most important. No, but just, the, just the UV to UV propagator. Yeah. So this can right you, here. You can extract that easily from these results. This is more general. So in principle, you should be able to extract it. Absolutely. So actually what I plotted here is the UV to UV. Um, when I said I chose parameters, um, the Z and Z prime here are both one over K. Okay. Um, because because then, then, I, then I think I understand a little better my confusion about UV and IR because P is the momentum on the UV brain. When that's mm -hmm. getting large, you're probing more into the bulk, right? So even though yes. the bulk is IR, you're probing further into the bulk when you're looking at large P, right? Yes. And so that's the, that's the, the confusion, right? Um, and so I deep, think that, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say deep into the bulk. Um, sure. you, you can imagine that the, the lengths get warped up. So the mass scales get, get, get warped down. And so, um, so yeah, so that's the region in which if you were to set some like you know, energy scale, it, it eventually gets, yeah, it gets warped down, I believe, unless, I believe that's one way to look at it. So that's the region where, you know, the outside of the EFT in the high energy direction would, would come into play. I think the NEMA paper I cited calls this the strong coupling region. Um, not sure if that's helpful. Yeah, because I think, I mean, John and Sinja, you guys are more the ADS. I mean, I haven't thought about ADS in a long time, but I believe that, let's say I put in some higher dimension interaction in the ADS bulk, okay? There's some coefficient in front of that, okay? And so uh, now what I should do to, if I'm doing some local experiment in different places in the bulk, I should express that 
coefficient in terms of my local metric, right? Which is warped. So I get a different scale at different places in the bulk, okay? But when I do that, I should be, that is the scale at which some local measurement is breaking down, right? Yeah, if you're trying to preserve the bulk. Yeah, I, want the, the I want the theory to be under control. So, so I, I think to... Lexi's higher derivative interaction didn't have a metric factor like that. Oh, no, I'm sure right? you had a metric. I'm sure that you had a met, you have a metric and that was just some there was slide either. abbreviation or something. You certainly the met, the indices are contracted with the metric. It's raised and lowered with the metric, dude. Come on, <laughs> right? I mean, so so what I'm confused about is that my impression was that uh, you know, so even though there's a scale dependence for where it breaks down, what what am I? What should I? If I think in terms of the UV to UV propagator, that's the thing that's the easiest for me to interpret physically. Okay, because it just has to do with what some observer on the brain would see if they were, you know, if they were if they were probing things on the brain, right? And they're coupled to this this ADS sector. Where would I expect a higher? Do I expect that a if a higher dimension operator is under control near the UV brain, would I expect it to be always under control, or what? What? So yeah, if a higher dimension operator is under control near the UV brain, I believe you lose control at really, really far into the bulk. So sorry, sorry. So if it's okay at the UV brain, it gets better or worse as I, as I look at this operator further into the IR. It gets better or worse, of course. So, something like zeta should get worse. Should get worse in the IR. Is there, how do I understand that? Why is that? I mean that this term, this derivative term scales like the kinetic term for this field, right? Oh, there's an extra field. I'm not sure it looks exactly like a kinetic Yeah, but the, the momentum and Z dependence is the same. You would say phi to the 100th is looks like a mass term. I wouldn't think that. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. Well, you're saying don't it's a big term because it has two derivatives, but you're not counting the fields. Yeah, I'm counting the derivatives and the z's, but not the fields. Yeah. Is that because the cutoff in the IR becomes lower and lower? Here yeah, and that's what. I, that's yeah. <laughs> Exactly, it's something like that, right? I think that's one way to look at it. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm if I'm looking at some very high energy IR uh, probe on the UV brain, so I'm probing more into the into the into the um, bulk, right? And then compared to the IR cutoff there, but then then it would say that in you know let's say infinite ADS that if I have any higher dimension operator, I can't go see all the way into the IR in effective field theory, that also doesn't quite sound right. You're saying I can't calculate anything in global ADS. Maybe that's true. Yeah, maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. One, I guess, um, I mean, in the global picture, ADS has a as a potential well at the in the middle, and in the global coordinates, if I if I drop something that's you know at rest in the global coordinates, which is very very does not look at all like it's at rest in Poincaré, so maybe this is wrong headed. But then if I let it go, it will drop, and they will sort of meet in the center. And uh, they will get an arbitrarily large redshift. So they'll collide with a lot of energy. So maybe some remnant of that is, I don't know. 
One, I, I guess, I guess one extra way to think of this, if, if it helps at all, if, 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 if you believe everything, then like here, then, um, so, sorry, uh, so, so here our spectrum of KK mode starts, starts as like narrow resonances and then eventually merges to form a continuum. I guess your other option is that you uh, don't, don't ever merge. And so you just have narrow resonances forever. And so despite, no matter how high of an energy scale you go to, the somehow this small mass scale that, that is, you know, the, the, the breaking of the conformal symmetry always matters. Um, so I, I guess that's the alternative option, which, um, you know, it doesn't really match intuition from what the intuition I have. Um, the, the third option is the spherical decays. Um, so I don't, yes. I don't see how your result matches the spherical decays. Um, So the the spherical decays can still happen. Um, because the so the the, I, I, the vertices typically occur uh, when they they typically occur in the region that's not uh, opaque to propagation, the, the region that's not exponentially suppressed from propagation. Right. But to get the spherical decays, the KK modes decay to things whose masses almost add up to the first, the parent. Yes. Mass. Yes. So it, the decays are phase space suppressed. Yes. So they tend to be narrow in some sense. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I mean, can, can, I, can I tell you my intuition? I've, I've sure. got, I'm really sorry, but I, I have to go. I, have to, I just got a text. I've got to pick up my my, my son, so I'm going to bug out. But I'm, I'm just going to cause maximal confusion by just telling you my my intuition. Okay, but so 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 you can ask just the question. Forget about ADS just for a second. I've got some system. It's got tons of degrees of freedom. Okay, and. I want to know whether the following thing is possible. You know, I'm 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 living so in the ADS. I'm living on the UV brain. I'm probing this sector, and so now uh, this sector has got tons of particles. Particles can decay, decay to other particles. Blah blah blah. Okay. Now I want to know whether the following thing is possible. I create a particle. Okay. And uh, if I neglect its width, I get some answer. Okay. But now I want to know. No, that answer is completely wrong. It's not even wrong by one hundred percent. It's wrong by a factor of a thousand, a million. It's some wrong by some huge factor, and the reason it's wrong is because, in some sense, the width, okay, the decay width, is completely dominating over the naive production, okay, and I I have theoretical control of this weird system, okay. So the system has particles that are so broad, okay, that it's not even a good approximation at the 100% level to neglect their width. Their width suppress the, the, the decays by you know, a factor of a 10, 1,000, 100, whatever, OK? Is that possible under theoretical control? I think the answer is no. <laughs> I think, so my intuition is that you can, that this opacity effect can only ever be important exactly when you're losing control of the effective theory. You no longer have theoretical control. That's my intuition. Because widths, as soon as widths become as big as masses, you don't have control anymore. And, and this extra dimensional language is making this hard to see, but in terms of some KK language, I think that would be the, the answer. That's my intuition, I don't know. Um, okay. Thank, thank you for your intuition, Marcus. It, it's unfortunate that you have to go. I would love to talk I, yeah, some more. I mean, I'd be happy to talk some more about this offline, but I really do have to go. I just, uh, I'm, I'm actually already late, so. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for doing that to you. <laughs>
no, 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 that's that's not you. That's me. I mean, my my my, my I have to, but I do have to get him. So anyway, so thanks, Lexi. I'll let you guys talk some more. Maybe you know, and I'll we'll be in touch. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. You too. Let's stop recording and get uh, some more confused. Ah, it is still recording. Fun.